Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us. I'm Indy Mandel, and I am back again with Jacob and Jed. And we're going to wrap up book four of The Republic and go on to book five. As always, we're using the lobe, and as always, there is a link in the description box for a PDF version. So the place we ended off last time was here at the end of book four. The last thing we talked about in section 18 was that um, Socrates then took all the four virtues after summarizing them and looking at how they function together. He then put them together and just called it virtue. And he used it in place of the word justice. So he's saying that justice is like, if you look at all four virtues together in this dialogue, he's calling it justice or virtue. And he says that what we need to pursue then are beautiful and honorable pursuits. And these are the things that are going to allow us to preserve that justice in the soul that keeps the other virtues in their proper function. And so that's where we ended things last time. So we have one final section, and this is going to lead us into book five. Okay, so um, keep our usual reading order. Okay, okay. So Jacob, whenever you're ready, you can start reading. Oh, and I'm sorry. And now, I, just say, oh, sorry. I should just say, um, for those of you who might have a different text, this is 445A in the, the Stephanus number, 445A. Okay, sorry. Please go ahead. And now, at last, it seems it remains for us to consider whether it is profitable to do justice and practice honorable pursuits and be just whether one is known to be such or not, or whether injustice profits, and to be unjust, if only a man escape punishment and is not bettered by chastisement. Nay, Socrates, I think that from this point our inquiry becomes an absurdity, if, while life is admittedly, admittedly, intolerable with a ruined constitution of body even though accompanied by all the food and drink and wealth and power in the world we are yet to be asked to suppose that when the very nature and constitution of that whereby we live is disordered and corrupted life is going to be worth living if a man can only do as he pleases and pleases to do anything save that which will rid him of evil and injustice, and make him possessed of justice and virtue. Now that the two have been shown to be as we have described them. Yes, it is absurd. But nevertheless, now that we have won to this height, we must not grow weary in endeavoring to discover with the utmost possible clearness that these things are so. That is the last thing in the world we must do. Come up here, then that you may see how many are the kinds of evil. I mean those that it is worth while to observe and distinguish. I am up and with you. Only do you say on. And truly, now that we have come to this height of argument, I see, I seem to see, as from a point of outlook, that there is one form of excellence, and that the forms of evil are infinite. Yet that there are some four among them that it is worthwhile to take note of. What do you mean? As many as are the varieties of political constitutions that can constitute specific types, so many, it seems likely, are the characters of soul. How many, pray? 
there are five kinds of constitutions and five kinds of soul. Well, I'll be. Tell me what they are. I tell you that one way of government would be the constitution that we have just expounded. But the names that might be applied to it are two. If one man of surpassing merit rose among the rulers, it would be denominated royalty. If more than one, aristocracy. True. Well then, this is one of the forms I have in mind. For neither would a number of such men, nor one if he arose among them, alter to any extent worth mentioning the laws of our city, if he preserved the breeding and the education that we have described. It is not likely. Okay. So that's a strange way, perhaps, to end book four. Quite a cliffhanger he left us with. But I'm going to go back to the beginning here, beginning of this section. What is it that they need to consider? Justice again, whether hmm. injustice is profitable or, or hmm. not. Right. And so now we have to understand what he means by profitable. It means making money because, I mean, you know, it's being having a just soul, having this organization. That's all very important. But, you know, can you make money at it? That's what he's talking about, right? I don't do think, think so. He has the different meaning when he says what is if it is asks if it's profitable what does he mean good for your soul hmm. Hmm. what does uh is this glaucon what does glaucon say it says even with all the food drink and mm -hmm. wealth and power in the world mm -hmm. Mm -hmm that our constitution would be disordered and corrupted and life wouldn't be worth living? Hmm. What would make life not worth living, is it clear? Because I'm just trying to get you guys to say it more clearly. What is it about justice that makes... Mm -hmm. Sorry, what is it about justice that makes it so profitable for our lives. And you can draw on everything that you've seen up to this point in the dialogue, not just from this section. What makes justice so profitable for our lives? What did they demonstrate in the sections before this that would lead to this conclusion here. Well, you would be virtuous. You would uh, not have to bargain with the gods or anything at the end of your life. You would mm -hmm. be... unburdened mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. your like fate mm -hmm. in like the afterlife mm -hmm. that's one part yeah absolutely yeah maybe i'm gonna go back a bit um his definition of justice back on page four from 413, mostly 415. I'll, I'll go to 415, which would be um, Stephanus number 443E, thereabouts, or a little above it even. Um, so a man must not, and for those of you using the same PDF, it's um, 
page 431 in the PDF. And he says, a man must not suffer the principles in his soul to do each the work of some other and interfere and meddle with one another. But he should dispose well of what in the true sense of the word is properly his own. And having first attained to self-mastery and beautiful order within himself, and having harmonized these three principles, the notes are intervals of three terms, quite literally, the lowest, the highest, and the mean, and all others there may be between them. And having linked and bound all three together and made of himself a unit, one man instead of many, now he's self-controlled, he's in unison. And throughout this whole section, throughout the, actually this whole book, book four, there was this talk about the importance of the soul being a whole, not growing any larger than to be one, and to have a unity within the soul. And then when we got to the virtues, the idea of a certain harmony and concord within that unity. It's not just any unity, but it's a, there's a proper ordering to it. And so now the person is self-controlled and in unison, and he should then and then only turn to practice if he find ought to do, either in the getting of wealth or the tenants of the body, or it may be in political action or private business. In all such doings, believing and naming the just and honorable action to be that which preserves and helps to produce this condition of soul. And wisdom is the science that would preside over that. Okay, and then in the next section, I'm going to just go to the next page here. He says at the bottom of the page here that justice is in the soul what the healthful and diseaseful are. I'm sorry, um, injustice is in the soul what the healthful and diseaseful are in the body, justice and injustice. Okay, so justice is. There's an analogy, soul to body, and justice is like health in the body, and injustice is like disease in the body. And so then that's why there's an importance of the way you act, right? So that was what we saw in the previous section, that once you have this just condition of soul, now you can act in the world. And you need to do acts that preserve the state of justice. And this is what he calls virtue, is it? this condition of soul and acting in this way. And so he talked about beautiful and honorable pursuits. And so he's asking here in this section, whether it is profitable to do justice and to practice honorable pursuits and to be just. What life are you making for yourself if you do justice and if you are able to maintain and by doing so, you can preserve this condition of soul. What's the benefit of that? You can just step out of the book for a moment. What's the benefit of that? Well, you're of one mind with yourself. You're mm -hmm. not at odds with yourself. Mm -hmm. You have a, you're unified. Mm -hmm. Do you remember the original challenge that Socrates was given? Can either of you restate what the challenge was? Remember, he was given two hypothetical men. Who were those two hypothetical men? Do either of you remember? The man who does injustice, but gets... Uh, everyone thinks he's just, but he's mm -hmm. not just. And then the other man is... Mm -hmm. He's very just, but everyone <laughs> thinks he's... Not not good. <laughs> He's treated poorly. Exactly. Right. And so Socrates had the challenge of saying, why is it better to be that second guy, even though he suffers all of these various punishments in the physical world and then even in the afterlife? Why is it worse to be the unjust person, even though he has wealth and success and everybody loves him and the gods love him? Socrates had to show that first of all, it, the, first of all, the gods wouldn't react to that way. They would know the difference. So that part doesn't work. But even the part about the earthly life, um, we see people around us. We can see in the news and the media and in the world around us, there are people who are really horrible people, but they have money and power and, and so on. And then we see people who are basically good people, but they're not necessarily seen as such. 
and they suffer. And so we can see this in the world around us, maybe not quite as extreme as this, you know, the black and white picture that was drawn here. But Socrates has to show why is it better to be the just person? Why is justice in the soul what is most important? Did he make his case then? If neither of you can answer, if we've gone through all of this, and neither of you can say, why would it be profitable to do justice and practice honorable pursuits and to be just? Based on everything that Socrates laid out in the argument so far, do you see any answer to that question? I would just stick with the <laughs> unitary, <laughs> you, okay. like being mm -hmm. of one mind. The just mm -hmm. person knows they, do, they have done good. He doesn't mm -hmm. worry about that. He, he's been true to himself, whereas... The unjust person will always question why he has gotten away with this. He'll always be at mm. odds with himself, with mm. the... Okay, good. Yeah, okay. so, yeah, that helps a little more. You're giving a little more. Why is it important to have um, that unity in the soul? Mm. And Jed, anything yeah. you want to add to that? Yeah, I'm pretty much on the same, give it, getting the same answer. Mm -hmm. um, if you are unified within yourself mm -hmm. and you have that um, state of mind where you know how to act appropriately in any situation mm -hmm. and you have an understanding or a science that we call wisdom mm -hmm. that can um, understand and mm -hmm. name um, what you're doing that's just in every situation, um, then a combination of, yeah, knowing what to do in any situation from that feeling and the understanding, justice and wisdom, and being unified within yourself would maybe give a sense of peace within the soul mm -hmm. that even if the gods hated you, then you'd know, well, okay, <laughs> they're missing the mark. Yeah, I think we can throw out the idea of the gods hating you if you're just, because we are already introduced to the laws in book two. and if you're living in line with divine law, then the gods don't hate you. They're never going to hate you. So I think that's already been thrown out. Um, and, and yes, I, I like what you added that um, there is a certain, um, in the appropriateness of the actions. I mean, if you're living in this way with the other soul in this particular order and you're preserving it and you're guided by this divine wisdom, then your actions will always be appropriate, and you know they're in line with divine wisdom, which means that there's a certain peace. And so even if you are, um, even if your circumstances are not as you would like them to be, um, you're, you're, they're going to serve you in the best way. Like you're never going to be truly miserable, even if you're poor, even if you're unhealthy. Um, there's always a reason for that. There, there are lessons to learn, and you're going to somehow carry that burden as well as it can be carried. Which seems like a, a greater character to be. Mm -hmm. Like uh, if you thought sort of a, a character in a movie or an anime mm -hmm. or something, a character who can face any challenge and mm -hmm. knows what to do in every challenge mm -hmm. can face new situations that he doesn't mm -hmm. know that could be good or bad, but he's okay with himself. That would be a better mm -hmm. character to be in terms of adventure mm -hmm. and learning and discovery mm -hmm. than someone who has everything planned out already, doesn't know how to respond because they're unjust, but has all the power and wealth to manipulate things to his own vision. That seems very mm -hmm. narrow and you're not going to gain a lot from that being that sort of character. Yes. And plus, if the gods are actually just themselves, then maybe maybe there's a way when you are facing that difficulty mm. to have an intuition that it's, it's, it's whatever suffering you're going through is actually mm. for a much greater good. Mm -hmm. And maybe if your level of wisdom is really leveled up, is really advanced, mm -hmm. maybe you can even see that. Maybe mm -hmm. you can step back and see the eternity of your life or lifetimes and say, oh, okay. 
I'm being, I'm a Socrates like character who's getting, you know, who's doing what's just, but is getting killed for it. But mm-hmm. in terms of the greater scheme, I, I'm not going to get wrapped up in this measly single lifetime because mm-hmm. my wisdom allows me to see the justice of many lifetimes, maybe. Yes. Yeah, I think you can. Um, I want to go on to the last page here. Um, yeah, so, so the next page, um, this is uh, page 421. Here they were talking, this was more of um, Glaucon's side of it. And then Socrates had an idea of um, how he wants to address this. And he introduces something, and this is on the last page of book four. He talks about different political constitutions and the characters of soul that match to them. This is all very curious, right? Now, for those who have read this before, you know that this is foreshadowing of book eight, because that's where he's going to go into uh, four different constitutions and the souls that match to them. And so the cliffhanger then is to see what's what happens in books five, six, and seven that would interfere with this conversation, because it seems to be where it's going from here. So we'll have to see what what happens in book five that he gets taken off this course. But this is where he's going. So he says here that there are an infinite, where does that? Um, there's an infinite number. The forms of evil are infinite. Yeah. Um, from a point of outlook, there is one form of excellence the one that's already been outlined, and the forms of evil are infinite. But he's going to talk about four in particular that stand out, and then there is, you know, infinite variations. So these are the main four. And he says, so in total, one form of excellence, four forms of various degrees of unhealthiness. I don't know when to use the word evil because it has a different connotation in our modern way of thinking. It's not the Christian sense of evil, but unhealthiness in the soul. So four forms of unhealthiness. So in total, there are five kinds of constitutions in five kinds of soul. Okay, and so that's a little foreshadowing. So now he's given us kind of a promise so we can write an IOU. He owes us something, so he has to make good on that. Right, so that's something to hold on to. And then look how he ends the section. He says, if one man of surpassing merit rose among the rulers, it would be denominated royalty if more than one aristocracy. So it's curious that we tend to call this aristocracy instead of royalty. But anyway, we do. Um, And Glaucon agrees. And he says, well, then this is one of the forms I have in mind. One of the five. This is the form of excellence. For neither would a number of such men, nor one, if he arose among them, alter to any extent worth mentioning the laws of our city. You know what? I highlighted the wrong if. Um, If he were to rise among them, he he would not alter to any extent worth mentioning the laws of our city. If he preserved the breeding and the education that we've described. So the second if, what's the importance of this if? Well, he spent so much time explaining how to have the guardians uh, correctly Mm -hmm. nurtured and Mm -hmm. yeah, they wouldn't if it was a true aristocracy or mm-hmm. royalty, they they wouldn't uh, paint. De- they wouldn't deviate from that. Mm. Right. Yeah. So preserving is the key word here. He has to preserve the breeding and the education. Right. It, some people they they reach these great heights, they may study some, they be part of a wisdom tradition, whether it's this one or Buddhism or Hinduism, whatever. They're part of that tradition for a while, but then they just let it fall away and they get caught up in the world again. You even hear stories of teachers who have taken some rather questionable turns, right? So why does that happen to people? It's because they don't preserve 
the education that they had fostered earlier on. And so then they fall into one of those other four patterns, the four unhealthy patterns. Okay, so holding on to this is, is the key here. Okay, so with this in mind, then we're going to go on to book five, unless either of you have any other comments you want to make. I would say just that uh, what you mentioned before about there's one form of excellence, but mm -hmm. an infinite form of mm -hmm. unhealthiness is mm -hmm. uh, really significant for me, at least, because mm -hmm. I guess with my notion growing up, like with a like a Christian background, you you think mm -hmm. there's like an RK of badness or like there's there's like one way to be bad but that's not how it is uh mm -hmm. there's many ways to be bad mm -hmm. but there the way towards the good is is unitary mm, that's a good point you know? yeah that if you yeah. sin like all sinners are kind of tossed in together right mm -hmm. mm. and you're just as bad as like the murderers and rapists and yeah yeah, and also, and also, actually, another thing which, where I thought you were going to go is to say that the idea that there's only one form of goodness, that's something that's also quite different from what our culture tells us. Because we live in a relativist society where, you know, you decide for yourself. It's whatever's good for you is what's good. And he's saying, no, there may be an infinite way of expressing that one form. We all have different personalities and different ways of expressing it. And we function in, in, in regards to the way that we function in our roles. Um, there can be great difference, but every good person is following that one pattern. And that's very different from what our society teaches us. And if it's tied to that state of mind of appropriate action and mm -hmm. what he calls excellence, mm -hmm. then... That really opens the door to a kind of um, understanding or study that we could do. We could mm -hmm. see, well, if the highest state that an athlete gets in or mm -hmm. athletes have ever gotten in, can we compare that highest state of excellence to the highest state, someone in meditation or yoga mm -hmm. or dance or music? Absolutely. And from reading this, I think we would suggest we'd mm -hmm. find out it might be the exact same state of excellence, just applied mm -hmm. in different ways. Exactly right. Mm, good point. Yes, absolutely. And if it's part of who we are, it's not something, our sense of what it means to be human is quite narrow, even the conventional sense. And we are broadening the sense of what it means to be human. And if we can include the spiritual as part of the ordinary, <laughs> what it means to be human, it's a, it's a basic part of who we are and what we are. It's the essence of what we are. Then, yeah, these things become much more mainstream. It would be very hard to justify exploiting populations for personal profit if you have this idea that the real purpose of each human life is to attain excellence. You'd have to ask these people that we mentioned earlier who have a lot of wealth and power but aren't the best characters, mm -hmm. are all these people that you're employing, are you providing the conditions for them to reach this level of excellence? Mm -hmm. If not, tidy up your businesses. Mm -hmm. This should be first priority. If you can make a profit, we might even allow that. But first, you have to be setting the conditions for this kind of excellence, if this is what it means to be human. It would certainly um, revolutionize societies around the world. Yes. That'd be fantastic. And education and yeah. courts of and, law. <laughs> and at the time of this recording, because um, it's going to be on YouTube, few days later, but at the time of this recording today, there's the um, annual report of the happiest nations in the world, and those which do provide that sort of lifestyle that you're describing are the happiest nations, the Nordic countries. Yes, yes, absolutely, yeah. which is fantastic, and yeah, and if there is a, equally so on the other side, if there is a quantifiable um, categories of ways you can deviate, well, that would make our justice system a lot easier. 
to, given this is our model of excellence, whoever you are, if you've deviated, which of the five, which of the four other ones do you fall into? And then we can look at why, and then we can look at creating the conditions, books one, two, three, and four, to remedy that, mm. which is actually what was mentioned um, on, the, on page 421 that we just read. Um, uh, he said it would be absurd to do anything other than what would rid him of evil, we could say, missing the mark in those five ways, and injustice, and to what would make him possessed of justice and virtue. So he's saying any, all of this other power-seeking or wealth-seeking uh, uh, ways of being would be absurd if you weren't doing these two things, purifying mm -hmm. yourself of your badness and injustice mm -hmm. and doing what you need to do to possess justice and excellence and virtue. Mm -hmm. So uh, perfecting and purifying seems mm -hmm. to be the game and Glaucon can see it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And if Glaucon yeah. can see it, then we all can. Yes. We all <laughs> I declare. Mm. Before we go and on, so can I ask what, oh, sorry, you, you're going to comment on that? Yeah, no, actually I was going to go on. So uh, before we oh, go on. I was just going to ask, what is the significance of him saying that there are two names for justice? For the soul, I mean. Um, yeah, in, in regards to the soul, I'm not really sure. Um, that would fit the idea of um, the political constitutions. Um, I I don't see what the parallel would be in the soul for that. Do you have any idea? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, well, it's to do with whether there's one or many. Politically, mm -hmm. of course, if, you know, mm -hmm. after mm -hmm. reading this, uh, both Jacob and Mindy can become the rulers, and I'd be quite happy to support that. Mm -hmm. That would be the aristocracy. Um, but if mm -hmm. just Jacob himself, he can be the royal constitution. Mm -hmm. But in terms of the soul, um, yeah, I wonder if there is a constitution of excellence where there is a complete separation from manyness, from duality of any kind, whereas there is an, a state of complete, like at the pinnacle, a state of excellence that can somehow incorporate manyness as well. I don't know if there are two. Yeah. Yeah, um, what I was thinking, and I'm not sure if this is right or not, but that within oneself, it's royalty. And then if a group of people who all have royal souls get together, um, that community, it's talking about more of like in a, in a community level, because that is where it's going to looking at groups. There will be a section on groups. Okay, that's actually where we're going in book five. So that could be some foreshadowing of book five. And for, for the analogy to the soul, could there be, um, when one raises through the levels of soul, uh, a community found with other figures, like maybe Socrates, if there is a, an eternality of the soul, uh, a union with Socrates or something, maybe to become an aristocratic group of enlightened souls rather than just your singular one? Um. Well, talking about living in groups, but as far as like beyond the human experience, um, eternally, I, I, I think that's beyond this dialogue. Mm. But it may go there. That doesn't mean it doesn't go there. I just don't, I think it's a bit of a reach to say that that's what he was referring to because he doesn't give anything in the text. But the idea of living in groups, that is in the text and that's actually book five. Right, yeah, it's it's easy to see the city analogy, but we have to keep in mind that it's also pertaining to the soul. So maybe it's the question that he's leaving open. Um, oh, but the idea of living yeah. in groups, even from the perspective of the soul, that's book five. That's what I'm saying. Oh, okay, but but aren't we also finding an analogy within a, an individual? Like, mm -hmm. isn't the isn't he use, using groups and cities and stuff as an analogy for describing mm -hmm. the state within a singular soul? Mm. Mm. Yes. Yes. Mm. 
Yeah. So, um, yeah. So within the soul, I would call it royalty. Um, yeah. I don't know what, it's, what it means to say of more than one, because within the soul, there'd only be one because it is a unity. I'm not sure. So I think that maybe it's more of a reference to living in groups once you have this state of soul. Or it's, it could even be taken to the higher level of talking about the constitutions of actual governments. Right. Maybe there isn't, um, like the mm -hmm. fact that he said there's only one kind of excellence mm -hmm. may, might mean that mm -hmm. within the soul there's just one kind. Mm -hmm. But to the names we give it in everyday life, we have two kinds. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, so going on to book five. Now here he's going to, he's going to start to expound on what he meant by what these other four are. And then we'll see what happens here, from here. So when you're ready, Jacob. Sure. Uh, to such a city then, or constitution, I apply the terms good and right and to the corresponding kind of man. But the others I describe as bad and mistaken, if this one is right, in respect both to the administration of states and to the formation of the character of the individual soul, they falling under four forms of badness. What are these? And I was going on to enumerate them in what seemed to me the order of their evolution from one to another. When Polemarchus, he said at some little distance from Adimantus, he stretched forth his hand and taking hold of his garment from above by the shoulder, drew the other toward him. And leaning forward himself, he spoke a few words in his ear, of which we overheard nothing, and nothing else save only this. Shall we let him off then? Or what shall we do? Uh, Jed, do you mind being Eddie Montes? Has Eddie Montes been all the way through? It was Glaucon. They were kind of, they were kind of tag teaming each other. They were tag teaming, right. Yeah. By no means, says Eddie Mantos, uh, now raising his voice, by no means. And then here's Socrates. What, pray, is it that you are not letting off? You! And for what special reason, pray? We think you are a slacker, and you are trying to cheat us out of a whole division, and that not the least of the argument, and that not the least of, and that not the least, of the argument to avoid the trouble of expounding it and expect to get away with it by observing thus lightly that, of course, in respect to women and children, it is obvious to everybody that the possession of friends will be in common. Well, isn't that right, Adimantus? Yes, but this word, right, like other things, requires defining as to the way and manner of such a community. There might be many ways. Don't then pass over the one that you have in mind, for we have long been lying in wait for you, expecting that you would say something, both of procreation of children and their bringing up and would explain the whole matter of the community with women and children of which you speak. We think that the right or wrong management of this makes a great difference. All the difference in the world, in the constitution of a state. So now, since you are beginning on another constitution before sufficiently defining this, we are firmly resolved as you overheard, not to let you, not to let you go till you have expounded all this as fully as you did the rest. Hmm. It set me down too, as voting this ticket. And then Thr oh, Thrasymachus jumps back in. We didn't even know he was still there. Uh, 
Surely you may consider it a joint resolution of us all, Socrates. Yes, here, here, rebel, rebel. Yes. So Thrasymachus has become quite, uh, quite the friend. <laughs> suddenly, <laughs> he's actually been listening all this time, and he wants to hear more. So, what is the objection? No talking about other forms of governance. They must continue the discussion of the royalty aristocracy. I guess because they don't understand it well enough yet. Uh, yeah, there's something in particular they don't understand. What is that that they want to talk about here? The role of women and children. Hmm. Right. Yeah. And so it's not really clear to us yet how this is going to apply to the soul or what they're talking about. But we know that there is some other area that needs to be discussed. Okay. So let's go on to section two, because then we'll get a little bit more of what's going on here. Okay. So unless either of you had any other comment you wanted to make, I don't mean to go too quickly. Okay. Okay. So let's go on to section two, because we have just a lot of cliffhangers. It's not really clear, but we can see that we're not looking at those other four for a while. We're still going to stay with the one form that is seen as good. And now there are some other areas about it that need to be discussed. Okay. So when you're ready, Socrates. What a thing you have done in thus challenging me. What a huge debate you have started afresh, as it were, about this polity in the supposed completion of which I was rejoicing being only too glad to have it accepted as I then set it forth. You don't realize what a swarm of arguments you are stirring up by this demand, which I foresaw and evaded to save us no end of trouble. Well, do you suppose this company has come here to prospect for gold and not to listen to discussions? Yes, in measure. Nay, Socrates, said Glaucon, the measure of listening to such discussions is the whole of life for reasonable men. So don't consider us, and do not you yourself grow weary in explaining to us what we ask for, your views as to how this communion of wives and children among our guardians will be managed, and also about the rearing of children while still young, in the interval between birth and formal schooling, which is thought to be the most difficult part of education. Try, then, to tell us what must be the manner of it. It is not an easy thing to expound, my dear fellow, for even more than the provisions that pre precede it, it raises many doubts. For one might doubt whether what is proposed is possible, and even conceding the possibility, one might still be skeptical whether it is best. For which reason one, as it were, shrinks from touching on the matter, lest the theory be regarded as nothing but a wish thought, my dear friend. Do not shrink. For your hearers will not be inconsiderate, nor distrustful, nor hostile. My good fellow, is that remark intended to encourage me? It is. Well then, it has just the contrary effect. For if I were confident that I was speaking with knowledge, it would be an excellent encouragement, for there is both safety and boldness in speaking the truth with knowledge about our greatest and dearest concerns to those who are both wise and dear. But to speak when one doubts himself and is seeking while he talks, as I am doing, is a fearful and slippery venture. The fear is not of being laughed at, 
for that is childish. But lest missing the truth, I fall down and drag my friends with me in matters where it most imports not to stumble. So I salute Nemesis, Glaucon, in what I am about to say. For indeed, I believe that involuntary homicide is a lesser fault than to mislead opinion about the honorable, the good, and the just. This is a risk that it is better to run with enemies than to, or than with friends, so that your encouragement is none. And Glaucon, with a laugh, said, Oh, ah, ah, nay, Socrates, if any false note in the argument does us any harm, we release you in a homicide case and warrant you pure of hand and no deceiver of us. So speak on with confidence. Well, he who is released in that case is counted pure as the law bids, and presumably, if there, if there, here too. Speak on, then, for all this objection. We must return, then, and say now what perhaps ought to have been said in due sequence there. But maybe this way is right that after the completion of the male drama, we should in turn go through with the female, especially since you are so urgent. Okay, so long section here and didn't really say a whole lot. <laughs> uh, one thing I do want to pull out is on page 429, at the bottom, he talks about what is possible and whether it is best. So two things that he wants to consider here. And uh, this is 450D, just right around there, 450D. Um, he says, it's not an easy thing to expound, my dear fellow, for even more than the provisions that preceded, it raises many doubts. For one might doubt whether what is proposed is possible. And even conceding the possibility, one might still be skeptical whether it is best. Okay, so we still don't know what his ideas are. He hasn't said anything yet. But we know that he's, we can see that there's a whole lot of hesitation here where he's wondering, should I even say any of this? Do I want to have this conversation? And there are these two things. One, so we're looking for why it will seem impossible and why some might question whether it's really best. Okay, so those are the two things that were introduced here. Did either of you see anything else in this section that you want to comment on or shall we just move on? Yeah, another pair of things he mentioned. Um... Mm -hmm. The difficulty in seeing whether it's A, possible, and B, best, um, is he lacks A, wisdom, and B, knowledge. He says, I don't have knowledge. And someone with knowledge or wisdom wouldn't be so um, worried as I am now to speak of justice. So we have kind of... We haven't really expounded what exactly wisdom is, only how it functions relative to the others in the ruling sense. So we don't quite know what wisdom is. Um, he did allude to knowledge being um, required to have some sort of rulership, but we haven't quite expounded what that is either. So when he was going along and saying, hey, I don't have knowledge or wisdom, I was hoping that one of the people there would say, wait, 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 what is that? Let's talk about, we can put the other things on hold for a minute to talk about these two things because they seem important, mm -hmm. particularly since you are saying knowledge and wisdom pertaining to justice mm -hmm. and without knowledge and wisdom, especially pertaining to justice, you don't know whether something's going to be possible 
or good for people if it's going to benefit them, mm. if it's going to be best. So mm. it seems to be two big um, fish or, or mm. what do you call that, um, hooks, um, uh, um, cliffhangers left on the – or teasers left on the table. Mm, possibly, yes, that's right. Yeah. So he's very hesitant here, claiming that he doesn't have wisdom. So now in sections three and, and four is a rather long section. We probably won't get to that one today. But in three and four, he's going to kind of expound his idea of nature. Remember we saw we had an IOU from book four that he talked about in, in, in regards to justice, that each person has to do their one job according to their own proper nature. But we never, but then I said, hold on to this idea of nature because it's going to come up again. And here's where it comes up. And so in his discussion of women, he's going to start with this idea and he will at least introduce it in um, section three. I don't know that we'll get to section four today because it's quite long, but we'll at least do section three and see how he introduces this. Okay, so um, Jacob, when you're ready. Well, hang on a second. Isn't this a big deal that Socrates says he doesn't have wisdom and knowledge? Isn't he the guy that's supposed to be wise and knowing? And especially, he's been talking about justice for four books. He says he doesn't, he can't use his wisdom and knowledge to talk about justice. What's he talking, what's he been talking from this whole time? I guess we can close the book and just leave <laughs> if you don't think the guy has wisdom. But uh you can say, was he just being uh, modest, or is this just a way to get out of the conversation? Or, um, and this dialogue is not focusing on, on wisdom, and they were focusing on justice. But uh, we're just we're staying in the text. So there I guess those are, mm. so those are our options. Either the book's mm -hmm. just contradicted itself, and we wasted um, many mm -hmm. hours of our life, and we can throw it in the trash, right. yeah. or he's lying maybe mm -hmm. for good reason. Um, mm -hmm. I think we talked about the idea of a noble lie earlier. Mm -hmm. um, or maybe he is telling the truth, but it's, a, but it's a kind of truth that you really have to be at a certain level of understanding to really get what he's saying. Because mm -hmm. maybe on one level, he does have wisdom and knowledge, but on another level, something about him saying he doesn't have it might also be true mm -hmm. because it belongs to the gods or something. Mm -hmm. where, where, where does he say he doesn't have wisdom and knowledge? Because it seemed to me that he was insinuating that he was confident in the stuff he's already said, but that he omitted this part on women and children just because he was uh, like less sure of it. Uh, as the preceding stuff if you look in the middle of page 431 he says if i were confident that i was speaking with knowledge it would be an excellent encouragement for there is both safety and boldness in speaking the truth with knowledge about our greatest and dearest concerns but to speak when one doubts himself and is seeking while he talks as i'm doing is a fearful and slippery venture yeah, he doesn't actually say he doesn't have wisdom. He says he doesn't have knowledge. And that openness is a big part of, um, of the philosophical life. It's not really this dialogue that we'll get into the symposium. The idea that you have to have the certain openness and curiosity that the philosopher is neither a knower nor an ignorant person, but somewhere in between. Um, that comes in in the symposium. But here he does say that he lacks knowledge, that he's not speaking with knowledge, that he's still seeking. Mm. Could this be because he's he's not a woman, so he can't like have knowledge of this? Or I don't know. That's that's yeah, a speculation. Not, mm. Yeah, it's hard to say more without going on and getting what his idea is. Okay, so um, let's go into section three. I think he does mention wisdom somewhere, though, here. Oh, did he? Maybe I missed it. He said that um, he talked about talking to those concerns 
to those who are both wise and dare. Did he say it somewhere else? Maybe I just forgot. Didn't get it. Which is interesting because that would mean that he's calling his interlocutors wise. Well, he's saying that he, he can be bold, um, talking, speaking the truth with knowledge to people who are wise and would recognize it. But I don't think it's necessarily making any inference about the people he's talking to, because he's saying that situation isn't what's happening anyway, from his end. Right, right. Interesting. Okay, so section three. Let's try it out. Pick up when you're ready. Asakis. For men, then, born and bred as we described, there is, in my opinion, no other right possession and use of children and women than that which accords with the start we gave them. Our endeavor, I believe, was to establish these men in our discourse as the guardians of a flock? Yes. Let us preserve the analogy then, and assign them a generation, and breeding answering to it, and see if it suits us or not. In what way? In this. Do we expect the females of watchdogs to join in guarding what the males guard, and to hunt with them and share all their pursuits, or do we expect the females to stay indoors, as being incapacitated by the bearing and the breeding of the whelps, while the males toil and have all the care of the flock? They have all things in common, except that we treat the females as weaker and the males as stronger. Is it possible, then, to employ any creature for the same ends as another if you do not assign it the same nurture and education? It is not possible. If, then, we are to use the women for the same things as the men, we must also teach them the same things. Yes. Now, music together with gymnastic was the training we gave to the men. Oh, yes. Then we must assign these two arts to the women also, and the offices of war, and employ them in the same way. It would seem likely, from what you say. Perhaps, then, the contrast with present custom would make much in our proposals look ridiculous if our words are to be realized in fact. Yes, indeed. What, then, is the funniest thing you note in them? Is it not, obviously, the women exercising unclad in the palestra together with the men, not only the young, but even the older, like old men in gymnasiums? when, though wrinkled and unpleasant to look at, they still persist in exercising? Oh, yes, oh, on, on my word, the funniest. It would seem ridiculous under present conditions. Then, since we have set out to speak our minds, we must not fear all the jibs with which the wits would greet so great a revolution, and the sort of things they would say about gymnastics and culture, and most of all about the bearing of arms and the best riding of horses. You're right. But since we have begun, 
we must go forward to the rough part of our law. After begging these fellows not to mind their own business, but to be serious, and reminding them that it is not long since the Greeks thought it disgraceful and ridiculous, as most of the barbarians do now, for men to be seen naked. And when the practice of athletics began, first with the Cretans and then with the Lacedaemons, Lacedaemon, that word, it was open to the wits of that time to make fun of these practices. Don't you think so? I do. But when I take it, experience showed that it is better to strip than to veil all things of this sort. Then the laughter of the eyes faded away before that which reason revealed to be best. And this made it plain that he talks idly who deems anything else ridiculous but evil, and who tries to rise a laugh by looking to any other pattern of absurdity than that of folly and wrong, or sets up any other standard of the beautiful as a mark for his seriousness than the good. Most assuredly, I can't imagine going to the gym now without seeing many naked old men. <laughs> Okay, going back to the beginning here. So we're talking here. Oh, well, there's a doorbell, but sorry about that. Um, okay, so talking about now the females among the guardian class. What he asks if they should be, um, if they share all their pursuits in common with the men, or if they should, you know, just uh, stay home and make babies. And what's the response? That's, uh, I think this is Glaucon. What, what response does Glaucon have? They must do the same things as the men. Mm. Although they are right. weaker. Mm. Yes, that's, um, I would say this, though, in Plato's defense, that this is actually more egalitarian than most that you would see, I think, at, um, at considering the time this was written. I think it's remarkably egalitarian. Actually, the next section is even worse than this one. <laughs> but even knowing that, I still think that Plato is much more egalitarian because of this idea here that the women and the men do the same pursuits and they should therefore have the same education. I think that was pretty radical in his day. Um, apparently, there were maybe a small number of female students at the academy, but there were it wasn't unheard of. There was at least two, I think, that have been documented, have been written up, um, and there may have been others. So that was um, fairly radical. So um, I'll say that in his defense. But yes, he says women are the weaker sex, and it's even worse in the next section. But we Does should he... get... This... Oh, sorry? I mean, it's, it's radical even, sadly, for many cultures <laughs> in our current society. That's true. That's true. Yes. It's it's wild. I mean, with what have we been doing the last 2,000 years? Come on, guys, <laughs> read the book. <laughs> well, they have been reading the book. That just not this one. They've been reading their own book. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, Lord. Um, do you yeah. think that's unfair, though? Like he's saying they raised the whelp, whelps, which is a fun fun word to talk about, kids. Um, but they have to do everything. But we understand they're physically not as strong. I mean, physically, women are the ones who make babies. So I can't help that. But anyway, um, women, on, he's giving the same nurture and education. Oh, oh right, right. The, the whelps thing is, is the funny mm. word. But, but him saying that we understand women not to be as physically strong as men, is that sexist or is that a fact? Um, generally speaking, well, if we're looking at biology, men have more testosterone and more muscles, different muscle structure. So there is, a, there is an, a reason why, like the Olympics has for some sports, you know, men and women separated, 
And also there's even within each each sex, there's there are weight classes sometimes. Right. So, I mean, there's a recognition that there are physical differences among humans. So I think that's a point where maybe I'm a little. Um, I know some people will, will complain that I've said this, that a woman shouldn't say this, but I think it's true that men on average, I mean, you can always find like there is a woman who's very strong and a man who's weak, but on average, men do have more upper body strength than women have. And women are stronger in the lower body than the upper body. That's just a fact. Right. And it's um, important to realize that but, it's a distribution that of course there's going to be many women stronger than many men, yeah. but on the distribution side, yeah. But when and you're dealing with things that are not dealing with the physical, I want to just add, like we're talking about billiards or bowling or playing guitar. It doesn't make sense to separate men and women. And so there's where I get offended when men talk about like, this is like a, one of the best female guitarists. It's like, it doesn't make sense, right? It's like a, it's like trying to give a consolation prize and separate her off when actually she might be really good and be up there with Eric Clapton and the other greats, you know? Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. Right, so I, wouldn't... I mean, it's the same way as saying there are many, many weight divisions in boxing and mixed martial arts and stuff, right, like right. because it is mm. purely physical, but you don't mm -hmm. have weight divisions in billiards. Yes, right. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. However, it, 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 it might be safe to say, um, given that, this is a kind of a radical view mm -hmm. that women should be given the same education and mm -hmm. opportunities. Maybe mm -hmm. it's uh, more of an achievement that um, women succeed in certain areas, given the difficulties they've had to overcome to get there. Hmm. You mean physical or social? Yeah, social, yeah, not yeah, right, not oh, physical yeah. ones, of course, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. social right. ones. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. If anything, requiring more courage mm -hmm. and internal strength mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. reach, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, women have, we say we have to do twice as much as men. Um, so, okay, so they get the same nurture and education. This is going to be carried on in the next section, talking more about the idea of um, having, what it means to have the same nature. Like the, here we're seeing that the guardian Men and the guardian women have the same nature. They get the same um, nurture and education. And um, there was another point I wanted to bring up here. Oh, yes. Okay, so, of course, they study music and gymnastics, which you see here. So that's the same education that the men got. And then there's this whole long talk about how ridiculous it seems to have women um, exercising in the nude. But then he reminds them that it used to seem strange for men to exercise in the nude, but now it's at this time of this conversation, it's become the norm. Now, remember in the previous section, he talked about there are two things that he would have to address, whether it's possible, the two difficulties, the two doubts he had, is it possible and is it best? And we see him tying them together here. That initially people think this is ridiculous and it's not possible, but they will accept it when they see that it is best. Right. He says that somewhere down here. Um, revealed to be the best. So towards the end, at the very last paragraph. But when I take it, experience showed that it is better to strip than to veil all things of this sort. And here, but we lost Jacob. Hopefully he's. It just his camera went out. Um, yeah, to get okay. undressed. Oh, okay. he's okay. back with his clothes on. <laughs> um, so remember here they were talking about how it used to seem ridiculous for men to exercise in the nude. And then he says that when it was showed that it is better to strip than to veil all things of the sort, then the laughter of the eyes faded away before that which reason revealed to be best. So reason revealed it to be best. So once you see that it's best, then you can see that it's possible. Then it no longer seems ridiculous. What do you see as the value of this part of the conversation? In your own 
philosophical practice for however long, you know, you, however long you've been doing this. Um, do you see this? Um, there's an adjustment, right? That as you're changing your life, as you bring changes into your life, do you see this sort of um, pattern unfolding where first something seems ridiculous, I can't live like that, but once you see it as best, uh, now you can adapt to that way of life and you go through changes. I can certainly see this in my life. I wonder if either of you see the same thing here. That um, doing things differently, growing, changing, it feels unnatural at first. And before you've really seen through what is false, you're still holding on to the false. Even if you see it on some intellectual level, some conceptual level, it still feels unnatural. It can be hard to live that way. Until something snaps and then you say, oh, now it makes sense to me because I, I really feel that it's best. My reason has revealed it to be best, and it's my experience that it's best, and so now I can live this way. I'm curious, have either of you had any such experience like that? Maybe an example of this was uh, back, back some years now, like cutting the cable, or, uh, you know, mm -hmm canceling my tv uh, subscription yeah. because growing up i had watched a lot of tv and mm -hmm. even when i started to live on my own i had a tv subscription mm -hmm. and then i thought i don't need it and it felt very unnatural and at first and mm -hmm. i relapsed and purchased it again and then uh that last time it felt more unnatural to continue the practice mm. than mm. than it felt unnatural for me to cut the cord. And mm. so I did that and it's I haven't had TV in years, like ten <laughs> like ten years now mm. or something. So nice. uh mm. yeah, that mm. maybe is an example. Mm. Yeah, that's a good example. Yeah. So it feels unnatural at first because it's what you're used to. But then at some point, you, when you bring it back into your life, you can feel, oh, I don't really need this. Yeah, I didn't miss it like I thought I did. I've changed. And once you see that, then yes, reason reveals this to be best for you. Hmm. Yeah, that's a very good example. Yeah, this we've, we've been talking about... Um justice being mm -hmm. how to act appropriately in any situation, public or private. Mm -hmm. um, and we talked, Socrates just here talked about having doubts. He doesn't know whether he should do it, whether he can do it, and whether it's going to be good for the people there if he does. Mm -hmm. And I've, in my experience, um, that's been a big thing. There's a lot of options to choose from, which is best, which is even possible to do. Mm -hmm. And so many doubts whether you can do those things or whether you should do those things but if reason has shown one option to be best even though it can be absurd or hasn't been done before or many people will laugh at you that makes it easier to pick that one easier to pick that one mm -hmm. it's like i don't know i'm not wise i don't have this state of mind of knowing appropriate like high level justice mm -hmm. but i have reason and I have philosophical friends I could talk to, and if reason and these texts and the reason of shared with Socrates shows this at course of action to be best, that helps. It helps mm -hmm. quiet those doubts. It helps pick one option out of the many. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, um, and there's another sense where um, he's talking about stripping away um, in the, because of reason. So they're not all getting naked because they're super lusty or whatever, or they're trying to be, they're trying to shock the people at the gymnasium. They're doing it because reason has said it to be best. And I've also noticed that um, the times when I, uh, when it's appropriate to cover up have been times when there isn't reason present. 
But as soon as I'm with people who value reason, the way that um, Glaucon has been um, trying to encourage Socrates to speak. Oh, not inconsiderate or distrustful nor hostile. Yes, inconsiderate, distrustful, or hostile. Like, yeah, they're going to be considerate, hopefully considering. Right. Um, you can trust them. They're in, you know, they're not bad actors. They're talking in good faith mm. and they're not going to be angry bastards. <laughs> they're not going to be hostile towards you if they don't understand something. So those three adding to the presence of reason, then you can take off your clothes. Then you can, um, take away those masks that you normally have to wear to protect yourself from people who are hostile who are inconsiderate and who are bad faith actors and finally the fourth uh, there are unre- unreasonable but like even we talked with reason we said well if there are four categories of missing the mark of excellence and there is one kind of excellence and it's understandable there's no reason to have clothes on there's no reason to mask yourself up because if you made a mistake you can understand why and correct yourself and if you didn't make a mistake, you can learn something about that to maintain that state of excellence and share it with your friends, which would be beneficial. So that really stood out. Like in the presence of reason, you can take off your clothes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a very good point. Okay. Um, any there final one- thoughts Sorry, before we... Oh, did you want to say something else? Yeah, there was one more thing that stood, up, stood out at the oh. end. Um, uh, which is really interesting, his definition of what should be humor. Because mm. there's an ongoing conversation of how come certain, um, you know, uh, what's the word, um, traditional thinkers or conservatives or, or you mm. know, extreme right-wingers, mm-hmm. how come none of them are ever funny? <laughs> like how come the mm. movies they make or the stand-up, it's just not funny? And it seems to be what he's pointing out here. Their standard for what is uh, humor, what they laugh at, uh, is it's just not what they're used to. So if mm. they, if these groups of people are used to, you know, bad things or like used to making fun of women, for example, a lot of their humor is laughing at people who think women should be treated equally. They'll call them woke or snowflakes or feminists and they'll make jokes, at them, but they're never funny. And the only people who ever laugh at it are people who are trying to hold on with, to what they're used to. In the space of reason, reason shows us that these are old-fashioned views or they're chauvinistic views, and most people have changed with the times. Whereas Socrates is saying that's a bad standard, that's an absurd one, uh, it's ridiculous uh, and evil um, to have that as your standard of humour, but instead have reason and beauty as the mark and the standard of, mm-hmm. of humour. Exactly right. Not just hmm. not what you, oh, it's not what I used to. So let's laugh at it. No, uh. that's silly. Yeah, very good point. Okay, well, let's end it here. Um, those of you watching on YouTube, if you have anything to add to the conversation, put that in the comments section. We'd love to see it. Also, I keep forgetting to say this, but I am on Instagram now. There's a link in the description box to my Instagram, but it's just um, all about Platonism. You can find me on Instagram. And I'm putting some Plato quotes. I used to be on Twitter. Now it's called X and it's got a little funky there. So I left there and now I'm on Instagram. And uh, I think it's kind of fun. I mean, it's very simple in the sense that I'm not like giving long um, theories or, you know, expounding on my ideas or anything. I'm giving a quote. But it is a quote with a reference, which is something that you don't see. I see all kinds of Plato quotes that make me, sometimes it's like a kind of a paraphrase of something that Plato sort of said in one of his dialogues. Or maybe what they're calling a quote is something that doesn't even look like Plato would have said that. Um, and it's just credited to him. But these quotes actually do have a reference, so you can go back and see it. And if a quote grabs you, you might want you might wonder what's the context that was set in, and you can go back and look. So it's kind of fun. So um, that's on Instagram. Or did you look like you're going to say well, something? Well, I, I said something at the end when you asked Jacob what he thought. Oh. So I don't want to step on his toes. Did you have anything? No, to no. Say? 
uh, maybe I know that second section was kind of dry or whatever, but mm -hmm. the point he made about, you know, I believe that involuntary homicide is a lesser fault than mm -hmm. to mislead opinion mm -hmm. about the honorable, the good, and the just. Mm -hmm. I think that's important and that if mm -hmm. you are trying to you know, inform people about these things, you should uh, be very sure of yourself and mm -hmm. maybe follow the lead of, you know, great thinkers that have shown themselves to be a, uh, you know, good mm -hmm. influence on, mm -hmm. on society. So. Right. Or at least be honest about what is an opinion that you still haven't quite worked out versus what is an actual insight that you have. Right, because the condition of the soul, he ranks higher than the condition of the body. And so that's what he meant in that analogy, right? And follow Mindy on Instagram. Hmm. There you go. <laughs> yes. And uh, please like and um, subscribe if you don't already. And uh, hope you'll join us next time. So we'll continue on book five next time. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.